from everyone to say hi, Grand Brown. And um, I'll start with a land acknowledgement and then um, introduce the topic and our speakers. So we'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the land on which we work, study, and live. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationship with the land upon which we work at the U of T in, our, in the Department of Medicine. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, this land is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live work and gather on these territories. That said, land acknowledgements are only a starting point for larger conversations. More concrete acts of restitution and transformation are needed to address the underlying inequities and blatant discrimination and the distribution of resources between Canada's first peoples and settlers. Um, so thank you again, um, everyone for joining us. Uh, Christian has just posted some of the basic sort of housekeeping um, you've all seen it's being recorded. Um, please keep your mic muted when not speaking. And um, please do keep your video on if your connection and environment allow for it. It's much nicer than giving a presentation to a bunch of um, dark squares. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our to, um, the, the, the topic itself um, entitled Climate Change and Other Ecosystem Stressors, Understanding the Impacts on Respiratory Health and Infectious Diseases. We invited this talk because as we all know, the climate crisis is already upon us and presents massive threats to population health as well as the health of the planet. Some of us have been looking for ways to shift our academic activities so they at least in some way relate to this existential threat. Our speakers have been doing this for some years now. Dr. Chung Wei Chow is the Division Director for Respirology here at the UT where she works clinically as a transplant respirologist at UHM and academically as a clinician scientist. After completing her MD and PhD and, um, and postgraduate training here at the UT, Chung Wei obtained a prestigious Alexander von Humboldt, Humboldt Fellowship to pursue a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in uh, Germany. Her research focuses on developing and evaluating novel techniques for assessing lung function with a focus on chronic lung diseases and the development of machine learning techniques to improve diagnostic acumen. She also has a really neat collaboration with a group of engineers and public health experts on the health impacts of air quality. Chung Wei's research program is supported by grants from CIHR, NSERC, the NIH, and the Lung Health Foundation. Dr. Samira Mubaraka completed her MD at Dalhousie and internal medicine training at McGill. After specialty training in infectious diseases and medical micro at the University of Manitoba, she pursued a research fellowship at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Sam works as a virologist, medical microbiologist, and infectious disease physician here at Sunnybrook, and is also appointed in the Department of Lab Medicine. So Sam has been working on SARS-CoV since basically the outset of the pandemic in North America, with a focus on virus biology, bioaerosols, genomics, and wildlife surveillance through close and cross-disciplinary collaborations. She's currently focused on understanding the biology and transmission of, of COVID variants of concern and on influenza virus uh, zoonotic spillovers. Uh, she served on a number of national expert panels related to COVID, um, including um, for Canada's Chief Science Officer and the Royal Society of Canada. With that, I'll say thank you both for presenting today. I believe Chang Wei, you're presenting first. And I'll say to everybody else that we'll take questions at the end, but please do post your questions for Chang Wei in the chat because, of course, we will ask them at the end. Um, over to you, Chang Wei. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, by really thanking you, Kavi, uh, for being the genesis of this conversation. Um, because I, I don't know if everyone knows, but you know, sometime during the pandemic, uh, Kaveh had established his social innovation group, and we had met regularly, uh, irregularly, regularly, uh, over the course of the pandemic. And it was one of the most energizing groups that I had actually been part of, and that was really occurring at a time when we were really all very sick and tired of Zoom meetings. Um, and one of the topics that came out as being very important to all of us and the things that we wanted to make an impact on was this concept of climate change and what we can do to improve societal health. 
And so what I will do today uh, is really work, and, and, and I also want to thank you for the opportunity to, to, um, to work with Sam. Sam and I had worked a little bit over the course of pre-pandemic and then did some work during the pandemic. Um, yeah, I'm not able to. Ah. So um, I'm a very visual person. And so what you see is that it, the, it, the first picture I show you is what I think about. Uh, this is what I see in my head when I, when I think about climate change it, is the world being in a very, really very desolate place. But I think there is hope um, and, but I, and I hope that you know, time has not run out for us to, to do things uh, with in terms of making a positive impact. Specifically, we have three learning objectives for you today. Um, I'm gonna focus on looking at the impact of uh, climate change on lung health, and also to look at the impact of uh, healthcare delivery and uh, contributions to climate change. S Sam will uh, go over uh, the, the, the aspects of climate change and anthropologic drivers and zoonosis. And we'll speak a lot about, I think, the One Health approach to, to uh, tackling this. And what we hope at the end of this conference, uh, of this rounds, and I think I will be very successful, we will be very successful, is that if we, you, we just start a conversation uh, amongst all of us in terms of how we will tackle this. I don't really have any disclosures related to this. And I just want to start off a little bit by sort of looking at it from a very historical perspective. You know, climate change and global warming and things really have existed for as long as the climate, the planet has existed. But the impact of human activities on climate change and global warming really didn't start until actually as early as 1712. And it was really the, the invention of the steam engine that really drove the subsequent industrial revolution and the escalation uh, in terms of the impact of human activities on the global health. And, and, and as uh, you know, the world has changed a whole lot uh, since this early 1700s, George I, Louis XIV and, and, and Emperor Kenji were, were actually on the throne at that time. It was only about 200 years later that the recognition of, of, of basically greenhouse gases came in, into uh, in, became known, and this is really the work of uh, Newt Enstrom, who recognized that carbon dioxide was able to to uh, absorb part of the infrared spectrum. Sixty years later, in 1957, two Oshino, Oshino, just. <laughs> people who work at who study ocean <laughs> and water really recognized that the oceans were no longer able to absorb the burden of additional carbon dioxide that was entering the, 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 the atmosphere due to uh, human activities. And they wrote at that time in their paper that human beings are now carrying out a very large scale geophysical experiment on the, the uh, planet health. It really didn't gain a whole lot of traction, although uh, over the years, although you know, the, the, some of these were, were recognized by some politicians and by a lot of scientists, but it wasn't really until 1987 uh, with the establishment of the Montreal Protocol that there was really some effort globally to tackle the, the concept of global, um, global, uh, global warming and climate change. And at that time, that focus was really on reducing um, and the, the impact on the ozone layer. And subsequent to that, uh, there has been a lot of you know, international courts trying to decrease some of the environmental impact. And most people sort of within the field feel that you know, the, the, the inflection point came in 2015 with the signing of the Paris Agreement. And for me personally, I think one of the things that really has impacted is that the, the conversation has shifted shifted over the last 10 years from is you know climate uh, change is global warming really a, a, a real thing to now us really talking about how we can actually um, mitigate some of these changes and when we think about climate change I, I think about it as as two two different things the sources that contribute to, to climate change and then the consequences of this but of course these are all really very much interrelated and, and specifically, the three major sort of things are that of industrial activities, transportation, whether for pleasure or for, for, uh, for, for actually um, 
economic reasons and energy, specifically the, the production of electricity and energy that actually heats our houses. In addition to this, agriculture actually contributes significantly to other impacts uh, in terms of the environment. And I know that Sam will talk a lot about that. And the one thing that I, I, I think a lot of us really don't really quite recognize is that healthcare actually contributes significantly to global warming and to greenhouse gases internationally. And as a result of these activities, there, there, it does has led to uh, a lot of consequences. And these are just Canadian examples of catastrophic weather events that have happened, the Fort McMurray wildfires, the flooding that occurred uh, you know, almost periodically in Manitoba and BC. And many of you remember the ice storm that occurred in uh, Ontario and uh, Quebec some 20 years ago. Now, there's been a ton of really good uh, literature that have looked at the impact of air pollution, climate change on health. Um, and probably one of the earlier studies that, that came out was in, in 2009. Uh, this is actually a paper that is quoted a lot uh, in the public health domain whenever anyone talks about um, air pollution and the impact on, on health. And, and what happened at this time was that um, the, the recognition that that traffic uh, and car emissions generate significant amounts of, uh, uh, of air, air pollution led to policy that, that actually uh, regulated car emissions. And as a result of this, there was a wholesale decrease in the, the amount of, of part, particulate matter, PM 2.5, that was actually introduced to the atmosphere. And over the period of 20 years, what they were able to show was that by decreasing the amount of air pollution, that this actually led to an increase in survival and life expectancy in 51 US cities. Subsequent to this, there have been a number of studies in, in, in both in sort of developing and in first world countries such as uh, Canada and US that have shown that air pollution and, and living in close proximity to, to areas of high uh, traffic is associated with impaired lung growth in children and the de novo uh, uh, impact in development of lung disease, specifically in, in the development of asthma in young children and the development of COPD in younger adults. Um, the other things that have been, you know, I, and I think that uh, Sam will talk a little bit about is the, the impact of air pollution and climate change on, on respiratory infections. But clearly we, we know that there, ha there is a huge impact uh, of air pollution and climate change and development of interstitial lung disease, allergies, and cancer, and particularly in can uh, the development of lung cancer in non-smokers and in, in women. Furthermore, uh, there have been a number of really, really good studies that have shown that um, air pollution uh, in, is associated with worsening of existing disease in cystic fibrosis, asthma, and COPD, which is very well known. And in fact, more recently, there has been data uh, from several studies that have looked at the impact of air pollution on mortality following solid organ uh, transplant, not just in lung transplant, but actually in kidney and liver transplant to show that living close to or living in areas of high pollution is associated with increased mortality post-transplant. Now, less uh, is known about the effects of heat, uh, or less has been studied in terms of the effects of heat uh, on respiratory diseases. Uh, but, uh, and, and probably one of the better studies that, that came out was published a year ago in Thorax that really looked at uh, ambient heat exposure and COPD exacerbations over the course of 16 years uh, across several cities uh, in the UK. And it's just when I when I woke up this morning, uh, one of the first things I do is I check on the Guardian to see what's been happening overnight. And the first thing that came out was that there is now you know a a, a global heat warning in South Asia uh, that is causing deaths in school closures. And many of you remember that last summer uh, was associated with an unprecedented heat wave in uh, in Europe that led to also an increased death. What in this study, what they were able to show, uh, they, they looked at the records of like 1.6 million COPD emissions during this period of time. And what, what they were able to show very clearly is that for every one degree increase 
in the ambient te temperature above what we considered to be comfortable is that this was associated with an increased emission for uh, of 1.5 percent for COPD. And you can see here that you know this this is actually significantly higher in in, in older adults and significantly worse for women than it is for men. The other study that have looked at this is uh, also was came out of um, of Europe and looking at 15 German cities that looked at actually a, a, a much larger period over the course of 24 hours and specifically looking at mortality that was not related to an accident and specifically related to cardiovascular disease. And what you can see is that at temperatures, you know, basically beyond 25 degrees Celsius, that there is this huge increase in terms of mortality that could be attributed both to respiratory disease or to COPD. And that this is particularly high in, in, in people who are at either extremes of the age group. And the last sort of set, set of studies I will talk about is uh, a study, a very long-term study um, that looked at the effect of low levels air, of air pollution and what that means to the development of chronic lung disease. Uh, this was uh, mostly a, a group, this, this is actually uh, three cohorts uh, of people who were followed for 17 years, about 100,000 people. And what you can see is that there is actually no real low level of chronic exposure that is actually good for us. And it might be better put in this way when they actually looked at the specific air pollutants uh, that uh, were monitored, PM 2.5, nitric oxide, black carbon and ozone. And what you can see here across the board is that regardless of the level of air pollution, there is actually an increased hazard ratio uh, in terms of uh, development and hospitalization for COPD. And to give some context of what that means, this, this is actually the air quality uh, measurements from last night in Toronto. And you can see that the PM, PM all these levels of the, uh, of the air pollutants is actually comparable to what we experience in Toronto. So there is no level of air pollution that when you are exposed to chronically is associated with uh, good health outcomes. Now, the last piece that I will talk about is the contribution of the healthcare uh, to climate change. And I'm gonna start with a caveat to say that whatever I, I talk about in the next two slides is probably an underestimation of what we actually as a um, sector contribute to global warming. Uh, and part of this has to do with the um, you know, COVID-19 pandemic and the changes that we've made in terms of our sanitation and our use of PPE. But healthcare uh, globally actually is a significant contributor to, to greenhouse gases. And much of this is related to the operational aspects of, uh, of how we, we, we work. Uh, most of the uh, contributions come from the operation of hospitals and specifically uh, uh, operating rooms and procedure rooms. Um, in, within my community, within respirology, there has been a lot of talk about the, the use of the, the CFCs and the uh, meter dose inhalers and their contribution to greenhouse gases. But when you sort of think a little bit about what we do on a regular daily basis and you, you think, uh, you know, one of the huge things that we do is that we actually can contribute a whole lot to landfill and that the, the packaging of all the things that we use uh, is, it generates a lot of waste. And, and more recently, the, 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 you know, a lot of the other um, medical waste that is associated with delivery of health care. And in fact, the healthcare sector uh, contributes uh, between five to eight percent of all the uh, of the global carbon footprint. Um, and, and this is a study that uh, is actually right now a bit old. Uh, looked at uh, the impact over the course of fourteen years that ended in in twenty fourteen. Uh, this was actually a, a study that was carried out by by a group of uh, I think it was German scientists who looked at all the OECD countries and included China and India and the mix. It, it, this really looked at basically half of the world population and three quarters of the world GDP. And what you can see here is that, you know, we, we all sort of, 
contribute significantly to it. And this is where Canada sits. We, we contribute about 5.5% um, to the, uh, of the global sort of carbon footprint of Canada. Internationally, we, 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 we contribute, uh, you know, about the average of all the other countries. But the other thing to note is that, um, you know, we, 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 we do this, but we actually offload a lot of our carbon footprint uh, to, to, to the countries that actually manufacture a lot of our supplies. And, uh, and so we don't actually own a lot of our own carbon footprint in terms of what we do. And, and what has been shown is that the major contributors of, uh, you know, of what of healthcare delivery is and, and to the carbon footprint is related to, to the operation of hospitals and hospital related activities. And more specifically to, to actually the operate about 75% of this could be attributed to, to the use of electricity and other energy sources. Now, the, the, the two things, the last things I'm gonna talk, talk about is actually the, uh, the, the, the impact of my specialty, uh, my respirology, in, in the carbon footprint. And this is actually a really neat little paper that came out of uh, a group in, in, in the US that looked at the, um, the carbon footprint of, uh, of an endoscopic procedures. And, um, and, and what they, 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 they looked at was that in the US they do about 18 million procedures a year. And this is the equivalent of the, the carbon output or carbon emissions associated with that. It's the equivalent of, you know, basically 212 million, 212 million, million miles. And difficult to sort of put that into context, but one of the, in, in the paper where they talked about was that each endoscopic procedure generates about 1.5 kilograms of plastic waste. And in fact, I, I'm, I'm on, the, on, on the schedule for, for endoscopy this week. And when I looked around at the end of each procedure, you know, I generate four plastic bags full of waste at the end of this. Um, and so when you think about the things that we do, uh, even for those of you who don't do a lot of procedure heavy, um, so especially so when you think about, you know, even you know, the, the, the testing for blood sugars with the uh, point of care testing and, those of you who look, who look after geriatric patients and you think about blister packing of, uh, of medications and how much waste that actually really generates. The, the other thing that has come into, a, to, into the attention of a lot of respirologists uh, has been looking at the impact of uh, metered dose inhalers and how that contributes through the CFCs, emission of CFCs to, um, to, the, to the carbon footprint. And I was very happy to see when I was preparing this, uh, this, this talk that there, there is an international effort to actually try to gather data around the world to see what our actual, you know, what our actual contributions are. Because if we know what the, what the data is, we can actually develop methods to mitigate this. But essentially one meter dose inhaler is the equivalent of a 300 kilometer car ride in terms of the emissions. And when you think about the fact that most of our, our patients uh, in, with chronic lung disease probably go through, um, if they're well controlled, uh, probably use one meter dose inhaler uh, at least uh, you know, once a month. Uh, but if they're actually not very well controlled, they're probably using three or four meter dose uh, inhalers every month. And multiply that by the fact that uh, you know, chronic obstructive lung disease, COPD and asthma is the third leading cause of, uh, or third leading cause of diseases in Canada really adds up to a lot of disease burden. And um, I'm gonna stop and turn this over to Sam, but I, I think I, I would like to take this opportunity to really to acknowledge uh, my collaborators in engineering, Arthur Chan and Environment Canada, uh, John Legio for, a lot of the work that I, a lot of the knowledge that they've impacted on uh, with me and the, the opportunities I've had to actually look and see firsthand the impact of climate change and emissions. And having spent several, um, altogether several weeks in Fort McMurray in the oil sands region, 
I actually think that it behooves us to ensure that our children actually have a visit to some of the energy generating plants to really have a better understanding of where, you know, how our, what, what the impact is on, on the environment in terms of our current quality of life. And so I'm going to end here and just uh, this is what I hope that after Sam's talk, uh, partial talk that we will generate a discussion about solutions that we can uh, think about in terms of mitigating some of these uh, impacts. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chang Wei. Um, while um, Christian and uh, Sam are sort of taking down these slides and getting the next up, I'll just remind people to please feel free to post questions that you might have um, in the chat. Um, that way we can easily keep track of them and uh, ask them at the end or pose them at the end to Chun Wei when we take questions from both her and to Sam. But uh, without further ado, Sam, please take it away. Thank you so much, Kabe. First, I'll ask to make sure that you can see my slide in the full presenter mode. Yes, perfect. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. And thank you, Chung Wei. It's always good to reconnect. We connected before the pandemic and, and during the pandemic. And I'm not going to be speaking to this aspect of things, but I'll, I'll, I'll just pull on a quick thread from, from your presentation, Chung Wei. I, I, when you were talking about how much waste we produce, I think about, you know, when we were testing 7,000 samples a day <clears throat> here at Sunnybrook in the clinical lab, how much plastic we produced. Um, and then also, you know, all the plastic and, and consumables that that we discard during our day-to-day -day work on the infectious diseases side, but also in biocontainment, where in fact, you know, disposable is encouraged. So, you know, we really have to think about how we can do things differently, both in clinical and research settings. Um, so I think uh, maybe, maybe many of you will be relieved to hear that I'm not going to natter on about the impact of the pandemic. I think there's no question that, you know, the impact of zoonotic diseases and their spread are, is quite clear. And in fact, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about an aspect that we rarely um, discuss, but I think now is the time to really think about how we can prevent um, these pandemics and, and uh, high consequence pathogens from spilling over and having such a substantial impact on human health and then all the knock-on effects um, that go along with that by really actually shifting the focus from, from human health um, over to animal health. So I have no conflicts of interest related to this um, presentation, though I have received uh, funding for clinical studies as um, subcontracts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk and focus mainly on a um, systems approach to uh, zoonotic pathogens. And this is the One Health approach. It, it, it will sound familiar to some of you, but um, in many ways, it's all it also overlaps with a number of other systems approaches that you may have heard about. Global health, um, uh, planetary health, eco health, all very similar, maybe slightly different lenses, but all very similar approaches. And this is really where I want to want to focus the discussion. For a long time, and, and I have to admit, I myself was a, a bit of a skeptic because it just sounded so incredibly vague. But in recent years, and in particular over the last year, I think mainly driven by the pandemic, there have been a number of frameworks that have been generated. These are intergovernmental frameworks, uh, principally driven by the quadripartite. So that's the United Nations Environment Program with the World Organization of Animal Health, with the Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Organization for uh, World Health Organization, WHO, together really trying to tackle uh, this problem of emerging pathogens because it really is such a multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary challenge. And they have a scientific advisory group known as the One Health High Level Expert Panel, OLIP, who sat down and actually defined One Health, which not everyone will agree with this definition. And of course, this is so nuanced and it depends on your perspective, but it's at least helpful for people like us because we need, we need definitions to, as starting points and we need frameworks so that we can actually implement One Health um, interventions and solutions. So if we think about what One Health is, um, at least from a Western perspective, 
um, because many indigenous uh, peoples would say, well, this is this is not a new concept. This is how this has been our worldview for 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 uh, millennia. But of course, we, you know, from a Western perspective, have think of it as a novel concept when in fact it's not. Um, but it really does recognize how interdependent the health of humans, animals, plants, and the ecosystems we share are. And because of that interdependence, we really need to work across sectors and across disciplines. Um, it really relies on that kind of collaboration to ensure that we have healthy water, healthy uh, air to breathe, and also clean energy to mitigate the impacts of climate change and also support the sustainable development goals. So you'll see here that there are, you know, this is this is depicted in a figurative manner quite nicely. And because it's so complex in terms of a, um, a concept, people have broken down uh, pathways for action. And again, this is Olap's work. So you know, we really can't affect change if we're not addressing each of these pathways. So they include policy, advocacy, and financing. Of course, nothing happens unless it's funded. Um, also, ensuring that the, there's an organizational aspect of it so that implementation can be executed in an effective manner. And also, we need the evidence and the data to support all of these actions, right? Um, so as we move on um, to where a lot of the, what the genesis of a lot of this is, um, again, not really all that new. We've been talking about One Health for a couple of decades, and, and there was a set of principles initially referred to as the Manhattan Principles. Now they've been uh, recently revised, I think, in 2019 to the Berlin Principles, but they're largely um, the same. I'm not listing them all here. I'm referring here, for example, to cross-sectoral disciplinary health surveillance is just one example, and it's one that, that we've been working on. And a lot of this is based on the sustainable development goals. So a lot of the objectives are to achieve, obviously, all 17 of these, but certainly strong emphasis on number three, good health and well-being, number 14, life below water, number 15, life on land. And the Lancet has, has really embraced this concept as well and have designated a, a Lancet uh, Commission on One Health. And they've been working quite uh, closely with, with the quadripartite on this as well. This will be the last thing I say about, about these intergovernmental tools, um, but I do find them very helpful because they do set, they do provide a framework for, for those of us who wanna move forward on this to work in. And I'm just highlighting some of the ones that uh, relate more to infectious diseases. There's a whole, uh, it was the tripartite, now it's the quadripartite zoonotics guide um, that's quite relevant to our work and specifically surveillance for zoonotic diseases, making sure that that surveillance data gets shared and transformed into health intelligence. Uh, but then also understanding what the risk is. If you look, you will find things and not everything has pandemic potential, not everything even has potential to transmit among species. So doing that risk assessment is really important. There's also a more recent um, joint plan of action that came out from the quadripartite and there are six action tracks. I won't go through them all, but I'll highlight the three that are relevant to infectious diseases. There is no question that antimicrobial resistance remains a persistent and important problem that needs to be that needs to be addressed urgently. Also, um, tropical neglected diseases um, are another urgent issue that, so again, I'm using the word urgent because this action plan is um, for the next few years, the next five years. And then of course, uh, zoonotic spillover. And uh, that's really what I'll emphasize for the next few minutes um, as we go through the conversation. So we know that the next pandemic pathogen will most likely circulate in animals before it spills over into human disease. So the WHO you know, designates um, specific pathogens as pandemic pathogens, the ones that have spilled over and caused pandemics. They are all zoonotic with the exception of cholera. So what is driving emerging pathogen activity? This is really something that um, has now become an important focus as I won't say the pandemic is over, but I, I, I hope I can say that we are past the peak of the pandemic and there are other threats that are looming uh, and have in fact already spilled over. So, you know, there's a lot of focus on how we can prevent this. So again, I'm now going to shift the 
attention away from human health and really towards animals and ecosystems, because that is where we really um, have an important opportunity to prevent spillover. And I want to be absolutely clear that the threat here, even though 70% of um, emerging pathogens are, are wildlife in origin, the threat is not um, wildlife or nature, but in fact, our impact on on wildlife and nature. Um, and part of the reason I'm, this won't entirely focus on, on climate change is because you know, we've come to recognize that the key drivers of both climate change, biodiversity and biodiversity loss are the same drivers that increase the risk of zoonoses. So it's all this package together that um, you know, rather than splitting hairs too much about which is the greater challenge, we know that there's an inter interdependence between them. And I'm hoping to draw your attention to some of these relationships as we go through the next few slides. Um, so it, this will all be fairly high level and you can see how complex these interrelationships are. And in fact, I'll maybe just draw your attention to this bottom line here about the range of infectious diseases that can be driven by um, global warming, geoclimactic variations, and other anthropogenic changes. So soil-borne diseases, um, you know, thinking of, for example, anthrax and the release of spores from, from the permafrost, the Chief Science Advisor of Canada is actually holding an exercise on this um, because it is a potential, potential threat. Uh, Foodborne diseases, clearly because of, uh, particularly with respect to agricultural animals and spillover, uh, and antimicrobial resistance is very important, uh, particularly in this this partic this group of pathogens. Waterborne diseases um, are another important soil, even though cholera is not a zoonotic per se, certainly has its distribution can be impacted by climate change. Vector-borne diseases are really a classic example of how global warming and climate dysfunction, or dysregulation, I should say, uh, can impact infectious diseases. Rodent-borne diseases are another example. And um, let's say, I think they're using the term airborne here. Please don't overinterpret that term. Uh, diseases, I, let's say respiratory infections, can also be impacted. And we'll, we'll, I'll talk about a couple of uh, specific examples. But you can see here how why we need systems thinking in this. There's no one particular um, there's no one particular deficit or incursion that can lead to all of these. It's usually a combination of different things. So it's quite multifactorial, but also very very interdependent. So here's here's one example. Um, this was a nature paper that came out uh, fairly recently by Colin Carlson, who did a lot of modeling to look at the impact of climate change on uh, infectious diseases and zoonoses in general. But this is just one particular example that um, he highlighted. And uh, many of you may know that bats represent an important uh, reservoir for viral zoonoses. So Ebola virus, uh, most likely, uh, Sarbeco viruses, including um, uh, Mer Amorbeco viruses, so both MERS and SARS, um, rabies, obviously, and a number of other zoonotic pathogens. And you can see that based on uh, climate change modeling, these reservoir hosts are going to be changing their range. So the species distribution will change. Um, and also the likelihood that they will start having first encounters with primates will change. So we're, we're essentially, essentially is anticipating a movement of Ebola virus across um, um, to the east of Africa and potentially even on a broader, more global scale based on the effects of climate change on the host reservoir species, so frugivorous bats. Um, and knowing very little, um, because we don't really have enough surveillance in wildlife about how much Ebola um, is borne by these animals. This is all quite predictive modeling, but certainly something that uh, warrants additional uh, follow-up because now that we know that it is a possibility, we need to be looking for Ebola and other viruses in these frugivorous bats over a wider geographic range. This slide really um, is to bring things home a little bit more. And Vicki Ning um, is one of the leads here in Canada. She works at the Public Health Agency of Canada as well as Guelph, University of Guelph. Um, and she's really been looking a lot at arboviruses. 
So arboviruses are transmitted by uh, vectors, so principally mosquitoes, but, but also potentially ticks. And we know that, that these vectors are really sensitive to climate change. And there are a number of conditions that actually not only increase the abundance of these vectors, but also expand their range. So we're seeing a creep of what were once considered exotic species. Um, we're seeing a creep uh, north of the border. Um, so we're now seeing species like 80s albopictus, which we never used to see in Canada, or, or um, uh, 80s japonicus, which we never used to see in Canada. So this is really important. And, and what we know even less about, so this we can follow, but what we know even less about is um, the relative amount of viral activity within each of these vectors and how that is being impacted by climate change. And it's not just about vectors. For example, in Canada, we have a number of orthobunyaviruses here actually in Ontario that circulate between mosquito, their mosquito hosts and vertebrate hosts. And the vertebrate hosts include us as humans and um, small ruminants such as sheep and goats. And a couple of years ago, they started seeing uh, fetal loss in these animals. And it was because of Cache Valley, which was an orthobunia virus, which was causing fetal deformations in small ruminants. That was a signal that something was happening, but it can also cause encephalitis in, in humans. And you can see now why it's so important to take a, a, a broad systems view of this, because not only are you dealing with a range of different vector species, so again, these are um, orthobunia viruses, but you're also dealing with a number of different reservoirs as well. So if you're trying to factor in different hosts, different vectors, different geographies, um, it becomes quite a complex challenge. We know that climate change has been associated with milder, shorter winters. This protracts the summer uh, period and also enhances viral transmission through increasing larval development for mosquitoes, increasing the lifespan of mosquitoes. Um, accelerating egg development, shortening incubation periods, and possibly other determinants as well. I know we really want to spend a, a, at least, if not more than 15 minutes discussing, so I'll, I'll pick up the pace here a little bit, but I think this is a really important um, scenario to, to share with you. Some of you have, have seen these slides before, but um, there's a, a field site in Belize where a group uh, led by Brock Fenton, who's a bat biologist at Western, uh, does a lot of field work. I've, I've had the opportunity to go um, twice. And in recent years, there's been a lot of deforestation in the region. So there's a richness of bats, um, over 100 different species that normally live in this area. Some of them roost in trees. So when the trees um, are deforested, you change the ecology of of the host reservoir species. So where there was a lot of bat diversity and you know, a number of different species, which allowed some dilution of, of zoonotic viruses such as rabies, this deforestation led to a shift. Um, and the deforestation was to enable agricultural intensification specifically for, for cattle. Now, many bats were displaced, but one bat that did thrive because it does like to live in the built environment or, um, or some kind of structural environment are Desmodus rotundus, which are vampire bats. So vampire bats really gained in um, numbers in the same region at the same time. And the challenge with vampire bats is that um, they not only thrive because of deforestation and reduction in, in other bat species, but also now they had a fantastic source of food because they feed off of uh, cattle or they feed off of their hematophagus, they, they, they consume blood. So, you know, what better than a slow moving bovine uh, full of blood to, to feed on. So you can see the bite marks. Um, and there's one actually getting a little bit of brunch, a little bit of them. So, so they look a little bit terrifying, but they're actually this big. Uh, just for a bit of context. And Dan Becker has done some really excellent work at this very site showing um, the number of livestock outbreaks of, of uh, rabies virus corresponding with, um, so this is bovine rabies corresponding with areas of deforestation. So really critical to think about how land use and how, how it can induce spillover of pathogens. And they're these spillover effects tend to happen in these ecotones. So at the edges of pristine forests where you might have an abundance of, 
of diverse species that really allow the diffusion of zoonotic viruses rather than the concentration of things. So when we have these incursions into these areas, a couple things happen. As I already showed you, we can disrupt the natural ecology of, of reservoir species, but we also bring humans into closer proximity to, um, to the potential zoonotic um, pathogens. I'm very concerned about what's happening with highly pathogenic avian influenza virus because we're seeing a similar situation evolve um, here and we really don't know what the impacts of land use are for avian influenza virus. We know highly pathogenic avian influenza virus is dispersed across Canada and we've had a significant number of outbreaks, including here in Ontario among poultry. Across Canada, we've culled 7 million birds, um, and we've seen spillover into mammals, including here in Canada, and recently uh, even into a, a companion animal, a dog. We know the virus is reassorting. We know that it causes necrotizing encephalitis in mammals, has a high mortality rate in humans. We also know that it's acquiring mammalian adaptations and that it has spilled over uh, into marine mammals. It, the risk for humans remains low, but now again, is we're in this op opportunistic window where we could potentially try and do something about spillover. So this is where I'll wrap up and we can open up the discussion um, around you know, some potential solutions. And people like Raina Plowright have, have suggested that fostering landscape immunity is really critical in terms of mitigating the risk of um, spillover. So this is ensuring that uh, ecosystems maintain um, the resilience that they need in order to prevent and maintain barriers uh, from spillover. So what is what are these dominoes, these protective dominoes look like? These are biodiversity, these are wildlife health, these are intact habitats, these are um, healthy flora and fauna. So, Penultimate slide before we open the discussion. Again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. People have developed tools to look at this. This is a white paper from the One Health High Level Expert Panel um, already outlining what we need to do for prevention of spillover. And again, we have an opportunity before us, a real immediate clear and pre present danger in highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. It has not spilled over into humans, but it is pretty much everywhere else. You know, what are we doing about reducing risk? Do we understand what the drivers are? Um, and uh, how are we actually doing integrated surveillance? And in that um, action, um, um, in the joint plan of action that I mentioned before, you know, a number of different um, uh, specific actions can be taken and have been outlined. I won't go through all of them here, but you know, really it's up to us to move forward uh, on this of course in collaboration with others. So I'll just stop now and, and I think we should be able to have maybe not quite as much <laughs> discussion as we were hoping, but um, just to thank all the people I learned so much about One Health from um, that we work together on, on this um, uh, Royal Society of Canada um, policy paper. Um, and also a number of other contributors and a special thanks to, to the Indigenous scholars who really um, taught me a lot about, about uh, their perspectives and, and worldview. So I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing. I think that might be better. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, I, I still remember those pictures of bats from the first time I saw you speak. It's great. <laughs> I never thought I'd be at a grand round where I saw a vampire bat. So, but thank you so much. That's terrific. And also, again, thank you, Chung Wei. Um, so, uh, there's a couple questions in the chat already, and a couple of uh, thanks and fantastic presentation comments, including from Dr. Hawker just now. Um, one of the comments from earlier, I'll just give Chung Wei a chance uh, since she went first. Um, one of the questions was um, how much of Canada's uh, sort of contributions to the air quality, greenhouse gases, and such are basically due to our forest fires. I don't know if an exact number or just some sort of general sense. But anyway, I'll turn it over to you, Chung Wei. Thanks, and thank you for that question. Um, I think it's a, that, that's a sort of a complicated question uh, question to answer, but I, I the and I think that it will likely change over time uh, because as I had sort of indicated in one of the slides, these are all really interconnected things, but 
globally speaking, it is really um, you know, energy and, and the production of energy and the use of energy that actually contributes to the huge part in terms of uh, the carbon footprint globally. In Canada, uh, for most of Canada, it is really cars and traffic related to, um, sort of emissions that are that is associated with the uh, uh, with the carbon footprint. However, that said, uh, the wildfires are seasonal and they are uh, somewhat regional, but they are also uh, global. So, you know, if you look at the 2016 uh, wildfires in Fort McMurray, there's huge spikes in terms of uh, air pollutants around, so in the in immediate area around Fort McMurray. But when you track actually the, the transit of these pollutants over time, uh, there were studies that show that clearly it was the emissions from the wildfires that, that then was related to actually increase in hospitalization and deaths in the eastern seaboard about a month later. And I, I you know, the, the wildfire season has gotten worse over the last several years, not just in Canada and around, but in, in also in Northern Europe and in, in, in the US. And I think a lot of this will track uh, and, and add contribute significantly to the carbon footprint. And at the same time, I think the, you know, there have been a lot of uh, regulations in terms of cars and the, you know, many parts of Europe are, are uh, you know, to have talked about banning diesel and, and gas, gasoline um, powered cars and switching to electrical cars. And so I think that that will change. Uh, but at this point uh, in time, and of course the data is always a little bit old, right? Uh, it is that it, it, it's really, um, you know, energy, electricity um, and the production of, um, you know, fossil fuels that is actually related to the carbon footprints. Thanks so much, Chang Wei. Just one more question to you before uh, opening it up to for those left in the chat. Don Redelmeyer asked, I'm not sure how jokingly, if uh, uh, if every time he drinks a carbonated beverage, I mean, Don's case, I think it's specifically Diet Dr. Pepper, that's his favorite uh, carbonated drink. But in any case, um, do seriously, do carbonated drinks contribute? Just for those, of, I will just say, for those of you who don't know, like operating room gases are a huge contributor to greenhouse gases. And actually some of the same people working on inhalers are working on substituting some of those anesthetic gases for less like adverse ones. But anyway, Chang Wei, over to you. Should we stop drinking Dr. Pepper and other carbonated drinks? Well, I think for the sake of your health and, and your teeth probably. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know the answer to that, John. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, look, I think I see uh, Alan's hand up. So, Dr. Getsky, go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Kave, and thanks, uh, Chung Wai and Samira, for the, the talk. Uh, I have two specific questions. Uh, actually, uh, they're both specific. And don't take the first one to mean that I don't think that climate change is important or real. But I don't ever hear anybody except for Samira said something good about climate change. Some people like longer summers and shorter winters. Are there any benefits to the world warming, like land that previously wasn't able to grow food now can, or people feel happier when they're warmer? Don Redelmeyer hates the cold, is always complaining about it. That's my first question. And my second question is, I bought an electric car in 2017, um, uh, only in part because of climate change, mostly because I liked it. Um, and I could not go back to a gas car after driving an electric car. Is Do electric cars really, given the way that I have to generate the energy to charge it, it's definitely cheaper for me. It costs me much less money to do it. But am I really saving carbon footprint by driving my Tesla instead of driving um, a Chevrolet gas guzzler? Those are two questions. Anything good? And do electric cars really make a difference? But Chang Wei, I'm gonna ask that. I think the question, or, or to Sam, I mean, actually for the electric cars, I know a lot of it does depend on the, how heavy they are. They're actually heavy electric trucks that are worse than a lot of smaller gas things. But Sam or Chang Wei, do you want to comment on any? I mean, I, I have to admit that I don't really see any positive sides to climate change. And even though, even though there are some aspects that people might find you know, personally more enjoyable from a seasonal perspective. I think the long-term 
follow on knock on effects are will far outweigh any marginal temporary brief benefits. But I, I do, just to be fair, Alan, I think I, I do know that there are some countries like England, for instance, huge parts of Russia that will be farming more than they could before making wine. But even those same countries will also be flooded more and this and that. So I think that's what Sam is getting at. Um, there's a long comment, but worth looking at in about uh, blood products and other. Like Sam, did you want to make any comments on this comment from Christine? I'm just having a look at it. So I think Christine was talking about how um, okay, so looking at pathogen reduced products. Yeah, and it, it's actually a good opportunity to mention that um, the Canadian Blood Services has really been engaged in this conversation. They've actually hosted um, one health sessions in, over the last two years at AMI, which is the Infectious Diseases and Med Micro um, annual meeting. Uh, because not only you know do they have a role in terms of screening out for pathogens, but they also have a certain interesting surveillance role. If you want to do population level surveillance for for a very rare, let's say orthobunyaviruses, for example, um, for pathogens like that, you know, doing that kind of zero surveillance through CBS is actually you know possible because of of um, because of their role and position. But that's that's great to hear that um, this is actually being directly addressed. Maybe one, I'll just, if there's, there's no one else with their hand up right now, one question for both of you is when Sam was speaking and I saw the picture of the mosquitoes, I remember that today in PNAS, that huge Australian study was released. I think they released something like 3 million genetically modified Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Um, and obviously Australia has a interesting history of attempts to tamper with ecology and they mostly end up backfiring. This one, the immediate results seem to be positive, but obviously many people's response to climate change is to look for technological solution rather than to prevent further things. Do you guys have any thoughts on, on this, either when it comes to air quality or um, like the ecological preservation and so on? I mean, I'm sure somebody will be detonating sulfur gases in the atmosphere to prevent global warming, as has already happened, um, I think, once or twice. Did you want to go first, Chen Wei, or I can? Yeah, I, let me let me process that that question because it was a long okay. that was a long question. So so let me process that, and I will follow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I think there's always this discussion about prevention versus building resilience. But the fact of the matter is that building resilience has a cost to it, both financial and also in terms of um, uh, just acquiring more. Um, carbon debt, right? So the preference is always, always for, for prevention, but I don't think that we, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. We have to do both because if we don't um, look at mitigation factors and, and trying to build resilience, then, then um, we really are sort of left with no response, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think- Go ahead, John, yes, thank you. I think maybe I'll follow up with uh, by, by saying, I, I think we should look at the low hanging fruits and look at the really simple things that we can do. Um, for example, uh, things that we can do immediately is look at the medical waste that we generate in, in our hospitals and in the procedures that we do. Uh, when you think about the amount of packaging, the amount of recyclable, like none of this actually goes into recycling everything gets incinerated in terms of medical waste. And I think that there are very simple things that we could do at an individual level that could actually potentially make an impact. I, I think the other things that the, the, you know, Alan, to your point in terms of the, you know, the, the use of, uh, you know, electricity or wind energy, I think it takes a long time and 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 that's sort of where the the technology will come in is that the in, in terms of you know thinking about things like solar panels was that gen making a solar panel creates a lot of uh, emissions right but as technology evolves that will also decrease and and I have to say that um, the time that I spent in Fort McMurray and I had no idea how like how our energy was really generated. I had no idea what, 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 what a tailings pond was. 
And spending that time uh, in Fort McMurray, and every time I flew into Fort McMurray, I, would, I started out with a headache and I didn't, that headache never went away until I, I, I left. And, and I think that sort of having a look at the impact of that, and you know, we, we benefit a whole lot from, you know, we use, uh, you know, uh, air conditioning, heating, uh, all that is energy dependent, but understanding sort of how that, uh, how that, that is produced uh, as we consume is really important. And I think that from, uh, in terms of solutions, I, I think looking at it from very sort of individual low hanging fruit, things that we can do, uh, and then at the same time advocating for, 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 for change at a much larger societal and institutional level. Thank you so much. I know we were a little, uh, went a minute over, but this topic is so important and it definitely was worth it. Thank you everyone for your attendance and Sam and Chung Wei, especially for such great presentations. Take care everybody, have a great rest of the day. Thanks.